Today we'll be covering human digestion and absorption. In 1822, a fur trapper by the name of Alex St. Martin got accidentally shot in the stomach. He became known as the man with the hole in his stomach. This wound never fully closed and allowed doctors to use him as research to see what happened in the digestive system when food entered your body. A physician by the name of William Beaumont studied St. Martin for years. He would take a piece of food and lower it into his stomach by a string. What was learned by this was that the stomach released its secretions in response to food that was in the stomach instead of building up secretions prior to the food entering the stomach. Whenever St. Martin was distressed or angry, his digestion of food was impaired. This was the beginning of the understanding that emotions play a role in how the body digests food. If we look at the organization of the human body, the smallest functional unit in the body is called a cell. The body has 10 trillion cells that grow, absorb nutrients, use energy, conduct metabolic and physiological functions, and excrete waste. These metabolic functions require a continuous supply of energy. We learned in the previous chapters that carbohydrate, fat, and protein break down and provide the body with the needed energy for these functions. To transform the energy in these nutrients to a form that our body can use, oxygen is required. Adenosine triphosphate, also known as ATP, is the energy form that our body uses. In addition to oxygen, cells need water, building materials such as amino acids, which is the smallest form of protein, and it also needs minerals and chemical regulators like vitamins. To gain most of these needed items, you need to consume a healthy diet. So now we are going to go over some basic anatomy of how the body comes together. We have the smallest functional unit, the cell. From there, the cells join together to form tissues. Tissues is a group of similar cells that work together for a certain task. In the human body, there are four types of tissue. These include epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. Epithelial tissue are those cells that cover the outside and inside surfaces of the body. This includes your skin, which is on the outside of your body, and the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. You will see the initials GI throughout this PowerPoint. This is referring to the word gastrointestinal. These cells absorb nutrients, secrete important substances, excrete waste, and protect the tissues beneath it. Connective tissue supports and protects the body by holding structures together. Connective tissue also stores fat and produces blood cells. When we are referring to connective tissue, you can think of tendons, cartilage, bone, arteries, and veins. These are all made of connective tissue. Next, we have muscle tissue. This type of tissue contracts and relaxes. By doing these movements, it allows movement of the body. Nervous tissue is found in the brain and spinal cord. This type of tissue transmits nerve impulses. You now know that cells combine to form different tissues and that similar cells join each other. Once we have these different types of tissues combined, they form organs. All of the organs in the body play a role in nutritional health. One's nutrient intake affects how well the organ functions. Once you have the organs, you have an organ system. This is when several organs work together for a specific function. For example, the digestive system is an organ system. In this system, you have the mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestines, liver, pancreas, and gallbladder. The GI tract includes all of them except for the liver, pancreas, and gallbladder. Those are called accessory organs. This organ system allows the body to function normally. If we look at this picture, you will see the levels of organization in the human body. It starts with the chemical level that includes atoms that combine to form molecules such as DNA and RNA. Then you have the cell, which is the smallest functional unit in the body. The molecules in the chemical level form organelles, such as the nucleus and mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell. The third level is the tissue level. 
Remember, those similar cells join together to form the four different types of tissues in the human body. The fourth level is the organ level. The tissues combine to, find or to form organs, like the small intestine, liver, and pancreas. Once you have all of your organs, you have the organ system level, when certain organs work together for a certain function. We are going to focus on the digestive system. And level six is the organism level. This is all of the organ systems combined to form an organism, which is you. The digestive system is the mechanical and chemical process of breaking down food that has been consumed. The food is going to be broken down into smaller components when it is in the GI tract and then absorbed into the blood or lymph depending on the type of nutrient. Digestion and absorption are tightly controlled by both hormones and the nervous system. All nutrients that are found in food, such as carbohydrates, protein, fat, vitamins, minerals, and water are made ready for use in the body cells by the digestive system. An adult secretes around 29 cups of fluid that contains water, mucus, acid, digestive enzymes, bile, and hormones into the GI tract to assist in breaking down and absorbing the nutrients into the body. The GI tract is really important for the immune system and regulation of food intake. The GI tract is the physical barrier to microorganisms. There are many viruses and bacteria introduced in the body through the food we eat and the water that we drink, and the GI tract protects the body from absorbing them. The GI tract also produces hydrochloric acid, which destroys those microorganisms that enter the gut. There are bacteria that live throughout the GI tract, particularly in the large intestine. The difference is that we want these bacteria to live in the large intestine. The bacteria from the microbiota, which is a part of the body's overall microbiome. These are the healthy intestinal bacteria that help keep disease-causing bacteria under control. This picture shows the GI tract flow. The GI tract starts with the mouth and the salivary glands. The second part is the esophagus, which is about 10 inches long. The esophagus leads to the stomach, which has a four cup capacity for a normal adult. If someone consumes a large meal, the food can remain in the stomach upwards of three hours. The stomach connects to the small intestine, which has three parts. The first section is the duodenum, which is about 10 inches long. The second section is the jejunum, which is about four feet long. And the last part is the ileum, which is five feet long. The total length of the small intestines is around 10 feet. The small intestines are all compressed inside and looped around. The ileum connects to the large intestine. The large intestine consists of the colon, rectum, and anus. The colon is the largest part of the large intestine and has five sections. The cecum, ascending colon, transverse colon, and descending colon, and the sigmoid colon. The rectum connects to the anus, and so the beginning of the GI tract starts with the mouth, and it ends at the anus. The GI tract is also known as the alimentary canal. It is a long, hollow, muscular tube that extends almost 15 feet from mouth to anus. Nutrients must pass through the wall of the tube to be absorbed. If you look at this picture, it shows you the four layers within the tube. The first layer is the mucosa, it is the innermost layer. That's right here where it says mucosa. This layer has epithelial cells, which remember is the same type of tissue that your skin is. It covers the inside portion of your body and outside. The mucosa is not smooth. In some areas, there are tiny finger-like projections that project into the hollow interior of the tube. The inner portion of the tube is called the lumen. These tiny finger-like projections increase the surface area in the mucosa. The second layer is the submucosa. You can see it right here um, on this picture. This layer is made of those loose connective tissues, glands, blood vessels, and nerves. These are important because the blood vessels carry nutrients to and from the GI tract. The third layer is muscle. 
The muscle layer is a double layer in most parts of the GI tract. There is an inner layer of circular smooth muscle. You can see it right here. It's going around the tube. And there is an outer layer of longitudinal muscle. That's right here. You can see it's running a different way. The longitudinal muscle fibers run up and down the tube. The combination of these two types of muscle fibers is what actually moves food forward through the GI tract. The stomach has a third layer of muscle that runs diagonally to ensure that the food is digested completely. The fourth layer is the serosa. This is the outermost layer that protects the GI tract. The serosa secretes fluid that reduces the friction from it and other organs moving. Throughout the GI tract, there are sphincters, which are ring-like muscles that open and close. They are responsible for preventing food from moving too quickly through the GI tract. They also allow thorough mixing with the digestive secretions. The sphincters help propel food forward. There are five sphincters in the body. The lower esophageal sphincter connects the esophagus to the stomach and prevents food from going back into the esophagus. You can see it right here with the number one. Here's your esophagus and then here is your stomach, so it's located right here between the two. The second sphincter in the body is the pyloric sphincter. This sphincter controls how much digested food enters the small intestine. So you can see it right here with the number two. When the food leaves the stomach, it's going into the small intestines, and so your pyloric sphincter is controlling how much is released. The hepatopancreatic sphincter controls how much bile and pancreatic juice enters the small intestines at one time. So that's number three right here. It's going to connect into your small intestine. The ileocecal valve prevents the contents in the large intestines from backflowing into the small intestines. That's number four down here, so where your small intestines meet your large intestines. That's the ileocecal valve. And then the last sphincter in the digestive system is the anal sphincters, which prevent feces from releasing until a person desires to do so. And that's number five right here. Peristalsis is when food is mixed with digestive secretions and propelled down the GI tract. When you think of peristalsis, think of a snake swallowing a rat. You can see the whole rat moving in one big motion down the snake. This is what peristalsis is. It is a coordinate wave of muscle contraction down the GI tract. If you think back to a few slides back, we talked about the two muscles in the GI tract, the longitudinal and circular muscles, they are important in moving the food forward. Peristalsis begins in the esophagus as the bolus of food moves towards the stomach. When we look at the stomach, there is three opposing muscles that churn the contents three times per minute to digest the food and mix it with the gastric juices. Peristalsis is most frequent in the small intestine, occurring every four to five seconds. Another term that you need to know is segmentation. While peristalsis occurs throughout the digestive tract, segmentation only occurs in the small intestine. The difference between the two terms is that segmentation is a back and forth movement of food, so more nutrients get absorbed. Segmentation breaks the large bolus of food into smaller pieces and mixes it with more digestive juices. So if we look at these two pictures, the one on the left, this is peristalsis. It's that wave of contraction going down. Just like that snake that swallows a rat, it's one big movement of food going down, propelling down the intestinal tract. B on the right, this is segmentation, and that's those smaller pieces of food. They get broken up and they move back and forth, and they're brushing ac across the lumen with all those finger-like projections, so all the nutrients in there get absorbed. So segmentation is that movement of back and forth. The large intestines has a sluggish peristalsis. This occurs only two to three times per day, and it moves fecal matter towards the anus. This occurs typically after a meal has been eaten. The time that it takes or this to occur depends on the person and the types of meals that are consumed. 
However, the typical transit time is anywhere from 24 to 60 hours after consuming a meal. Digestive enzymes are necessary to speed up digestion. These enzymes are produced in the salivary glands, stomach, pancreas, small intestine, and protein molecules. Digestive enzymes catalyze chemical reactions by hydrolysis reactions. Think of basic chemistry with these terms. Hydro means water and lysis means to break. So we are using water to break apart a compound. These molecules are too large to transport across the GI tract without being broken into smaller molecules. These simple molecules will be small enough to pass through the GI tract and into the body. Here you have a larger molecule, sucrose. To break apart the sucrose, which is also known as table sugar, you need the enzyme sucrase. A quick reminder that enzymes are always going to end in ASE. So the enzyme sucrase is needed to bind with sucrose. To break apart the molecule of sucrose, you have to add water, and it breaks the sucrose into two small molecules, one glucose and one fructose. The enzyme sucrase will continue to be used to break apart more sucrose molecules. There are very specific enzymes for each specific substance. For example, lactase is the enzyme for lactose. Lactose is the sugar that is found in milk. Sucrase will be used for sucrose. The salivary glands in your mouth and the stomach produce very small amounts of these enzymes. Majority of the enzymes in the body are produced from the pancreas and the small intestine. The pancreas matches the enzymes that are produced to match the macronutrient content of the diet. So it really depends on how much carbohydrates, fat, and protein is consumed, on what type of enzyme, and how much is released from the pancreas. If a person is malnourished or has a damaged pancreas, then there is a possibility of not enough enzymes being released and nutrients not being digested and absorbed. Whenever food is not completely digested, bacteria in the large intestine will convert it to gases, which can extend and bloat the abdomen. There is also the possibility that stool will become greasy and foamed due to trapped gases. Seven liters of secretions enter the GI tract every day. Salivary glands release saliva, which helps aid swallowing, digestion, and also protects the teeth. Mucus is secreted from the mouth, stomach, and small and large intestines. The mucus helps protect the cells in the GI tract and lubricates digesting food. Hydrochloric acid is produced in the stomach and promotes digestion of protein, and also has an important role in destroying microorganisms that are pathogenic. Bicarbonate is produced in the pancreas and small intestine and is important in neutralizing the hydrochloric acid from the stomach. Bile is produced in the liver but stored in the gallbladder and has an important role in digesting fat. Certain hormones are produced throughout the body and help regulate food intake, digestion, and absorption. So all of these secretions are crucial in aiding digestion and absorption. It would be too easy to say that digestion starts when you take a bite of food, but on the contrary, digestion begins before you even take a bite of food. Preparing and cooking food starts the process of digestion. Starch granules absorb water during cooking, which makes them easier to digest. Think of uncooked rice. You can't really eat it because it's too crunchy. However, when you cook it, it absorbs the water and becomes edible and easily chewed and swallowed. Cooking also makes the tough connective tissue of meat and plants easier to chew and swallow. You can think of raw broccoli. It's really tough to eat it because it's tough to chew, but when you steam it or put it in a soup like cheddar broccoli soup, it becomes much softer and easier to chew. Digestion begins in the mouth when the teeth tear and grind solid food into smaller pieces. As the food is being chewed, it mixes with saliva and is called a bolus. The salivary glands produce around four cups of saliva each day, and the saliva contains mucus, which lubricates and holds the bolus together, lysozyme, which kills bacteria, and amylase, which is an enzyme. Look at the ending of the word, A-S-E. It's going to break down starch. 
but only about 5% of starch gets broken down by salivary amylase. Lingual lipase, which is another enzyme, and you can see that by the ending ASE, is going to start the breakdown of fat. Saliva has another important role in preventing tooth decay because of the antibacterial agents. Saliva is important for the taste and smell of food. It enhances the perception of flavor of foods by dissolving the taste-forming compounds. The taste receptor cells on the tongue can detect the five basic tastes. Salty, sour, you can think of lemons and tart items for sour. Sweet from sugars, like table sugar. As humans, we tend to have a preference for sugary items, and as you age, the taste buds on your tongue weaken, and the last one to actually go away is sweet. Bitter from caffeine, like plain black coffee, and umami, which is a savory flavor that you get from mushrooms or seaweed. MSG, which is an additive in foods, typically Chinese foods, is another umami flavoring. And there's actually a new sixth taste called kokimi, which is a Japanese flavor enhancer word that means a mixture of different tastes or mouthful characteristics. It's used to describe fermented or aged products. There are 6 million cells that are stimulated in the nose when chewing, but whenever you're sick or have nasal congestion, it affects the ability to taste food. There are actually many people that are sensitive to taste and can detect bitter flavors. For example, there's a certain gene that makes people taste cilantro and it tastes like soap instead of the actual taste of cilantro. Other examples would be coffee and broccoli. If someone can detect certain flavors in food, major food companies will hire them to be taste testers. Once the food has been chewed completely, the bolus of food will move from the mouth to the esophagus. The entrance to the esophagus is the epiglottis, which is a flap that folds over the trachea and prevents any food from going into the lungs. Whenever a person swallows the bolus, the epiglottis covers the larynx and the food drops on the epiglottis and moves to the esophagus. All of these involuntary actions ensure that no food goes into the lungs and causes an infection. Once the food passes the epiglottis, peristalsis occurs and the rest of the movement through the digestive tract is involuntary, meaning you have no control how fast or slow the food is digested or absorbed. So in this picture, you can see your bolus of food right here. That's your bolus. Here's your pharynx, here's your tongue, and then the epiglottis. And the epiglottis is that little thing that flaps over. So if we come to this next picture, our bolus of food, we've swallowed it now, and it's moving down. It's right here. The epiglottis is going to cover right here over the larynx so the food doesn't come down here and then enter your lungs. And so once this happens, your bolus is now going to continue down the esophagus. The epiglottis will raise back up. And at this point, this is now involuntary. Let me write that one here for y'all. Involuntary. So at this point, this is peristalsis of this bolus of food, all involuntary. Now that the food has passed through the esophagus and through the lower esophageal sphincter, the bolus has arrived in the stomach. The stomach is for mixing the bolus of food with hydrochloric acid and also for holding it until it gets released into the small intestine. The lower esophageal sphincter plays an important role in individuals that have heartburn. The sphincter prevents backflow of the acidic stomach contents into the esophagus. If the sphincter malfunctions, then heartburn can occur because the acidic contents backflows into the esophagus. This is the burning sensation from heartburn. The adult stomach holds around 2 ounces when it is empty, but can expand to 4 to 6 cups after a large meal. If someone consumes a really large meal, like people do in contests, the stomach can hold up to 16 cups at its fullest. The stomach does not do much digestion. Only water, some fat, and 20% of alcohol is absorbed in the stomach. The stomach secretes about 8 cups of gastric juice every day. These juices are released when you see, smell, taste, or think about food. 
So if you're thinking about chocolate chip cookies or smell some fresh cookies, then your body starts to release the gastric juice. The gastric juice includes hydrochloric acid, gastric lipase. This is an enzyme to break down fat. You can see that because of its name. It starts with LIP for lipids and then ASE, which is an enzyme that's going to break apart fat. And pepsinogen. Pepsinogen is the inactive protein digesting enzyme. Gastrin is a hormone made in the stomach that controls the release of hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen. The secretion of this hormone is the highest at the beginning of the meal, and the release declines as the meal progresses. As the release of gastrin lowers, the release of hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen goes down with it. Hydrochloric acid is very important because it inactivates the biological activity of ingested proteins. Examples of this is plant and animal hormones that are absorbed through food. The hydrochloric acid inactivates these hormones so it doesn't harm our bodies. Hydrochloric acid destroys harmful bacteria and viruses before it can enter the small intestine and negatively affect your health. One of the most important jobs that hydrochloric acid does is convert the inactive pepsinogen into the active form pepsin. Pepsin is a protein digesting enzyme. In the stomach, there is a thick mucus layer that protects the lining of the stomach from the hydrochloric acid and the protein digesting enzyme pepsin. For those individuals that take NSAIDs, such as ibuprofen and naproxen or aspirin, they inhibit prostaglandin production and it causes the mucus layer on the stomach to be reduced and it can cause damage to the stomach lining through ulcers. There are three muscle layers that surround the stomach to mix the bolus of food with the gastric juices in the stomach. The mixing of all this creates chyme, which is a soupy, acidic mixture from the hydrochloric acid. The pyloric sphincter, which is between the stomach and the duodenum, controls how much chyme enters the small intestine. Only one teaspoon of chyme is released at a time to neutralize the highly acidic chyme that is moving into the small intestine. The sphincter is also ensuring that the now neutralized chyme doesn't backflow into the stomach. The small intestine has to neutralize the chyme that is entering the small intestine and also digest the nutrients in the food. It takes approximately one to four hours for a meal to leave the stomach. If someone consumes a meal that is only liquid, like a smoothie, it would take less time for that food to leave the stomach and enter the small intestine. However, if someone consumes a high-fat, large meal, it could take longer for that meal to leave the stomach. It is all based off of what you are consuming in your diet and how long it takes for the food to leave the stomach and enter the small intestine. Another important function of the stomach is the production of intrinsic factor and ghrelin. Intrinsic factor is needed in the small intestine to absorb vitamin B12. The hormone ghrelin is needed in the short-term regulation of food intake by increasing appetite and food intake. One of the most important things that you will learn in this PowerPoint is this. The major site for digestion and absorption of nutrients happens in the small intestine. The small intestine has three components, the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. It is called the small intestine not because of its length, but because the entire small intestine does not exceed one inch in diameter. The interior of the small intestines has these circular folds and finger-like projections called villi and microvilli. The microvilli is the brush border that is surrounding the large finger-like projections called a villi. The purpose of these folds is to increase the surface area over 600 times that of what it would be if it was a straight 1 inch tube. The circular folds make the chyme flow slowly in segmentation, which is that back and forth motion, and you can go back to that picture and see what it looks like. The villi are lined with goblet cells that make mucus, endocrine cells that make hormones, and cells that produce digestive enzymes and absorb nutrients. There is a lot of stuff going on in the small intestine. 
The villi and microvilli make the small intestine have a fuzzy sort of look. The largest part of digestion occurs in the duodenum, which is the first section of the small intestine, and also in part of the jejunum. This requires the help of the accessory organs, the pancreas, gallbladder, and liver. So if you look at this picture, you can see the villi. This is one villi right here. And then this brush border, this is your microvilli, and you can see the cells lining the top of each villi. So you have many of these finger-like projections right here, all throughout the small intestine. And so all of this is going to have these brush borders, these villi and microvilli on the inside, and so it's going to give it this fuzzy look. The three accessory organs work with the small intestine, but they are not a physical part of it. These three organs produce secretions that are delivered to the small intestines through the hepatopancreatic sphincter and enter through the duodenum. The liver produces bile, which is a cholesterol-containing yellow-green fluid that helps digest fat and absorb fat in the small intestine. Bile emulsifies fat, and what that means is that it takes the large fat globules and breaks them down into micelles or tiny fat droplets. The liver secretes about two to four cups of bile daily. Bile is stored in the gallbladder until a meal has been eaten and the bile is needed. The bile that is released into the duodenum is reabsorbed once it is no longer needed and returned back to the liver. In one meal, bile is returned two or more times to the liver. There is a small portion of bile that does not get reabsorbed and it gets eliminated in feces which is a natural way our bodies get rid of cholesterol. So here is a picture of your liver. Right here, here's your liver. And what you see this little green piece right here that connects through your pancreas, this is all your gallbladder. And then here you have your pancreas. And so these are your three accessory organs. Now remember, they're not a physical part of the GI tract, but they're needed. And so they're gonna have the sphincter right here that connects them into the small intestine. The pancreas is the main contributor of enzymes that break down the macronutrients, which are carbohydrates, fat, and protein, and break them down into their smallest form. The pancreas produces five to six cups every day of sodium bicarbonate, which is a basic mixture. This basic mixture is what neutralizes the chyme that has entered the small intestine. Without the sodium bicarbonate, the acidic chyme would damage the small intestine. The enzymes that the pancreas produces includes pancreatic amylase to break down starch, pancreatic lipase to break down fat, and pancreatic proteases to break down protein. So let's walk through a meal so you can picture what happens with your digestive system. First things first, you think about your turkey sandwich before you even made it. As you eat the turkey sandwich, gastrin is produced in the stomach, which signals the release of hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen. You have chewed and swallowed your turkey sandwich, and it is a bolus of food traveling down your esophagus toward the stomach through peristalsis. The lower esophageal sphincter opens up and the bolus enters the stomach where the three muscles churn your bolus of turkey sandwich. It mixes with the hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen and is now called chyme. Once this happens, one teaspoon at a time, the chyme of turkey sandwich is released into the small intestine. At this point, the gallbladder, which stores the bile from the liver, and the pancreas release their secretions and meet with the acidic chyme to neutralize it and start breaking down the carbohydrates, fat, and protein that was in your sandwich. As the chyme moves along in the small intestines through peristalsis, it is also moving by segmentation to really make the nutrients pass along the microvilli and the villi in the lumen of the small intestine. This chart is showing you the primary nutrients absorbed in each organ. The stomach does not have much absorption going on. However, 
the stomach does absorb a very small amount of water and 20% of alcohol. The small intestine is the major site for digestion and absorption. This is where calcium, magnesium, and other minerals are absorbed, as well as glucose, amino acids, which is the smallest form of protein, fats, vitamins, most water, and 80% of alcohol. The large intestine absorbs sodium, potassium, vitamin K, and 10 to 30% of water. The absorptive cells start off at the base of the villi which is the finger-like projections, and as they get older, they migrate towards the top of the villi. As they migrate, the absorptive capabilities increase, but by the time they reach the top of the villi, the digestive enzymes have destroyed them so they get shed into the lumen. This occurs every two to five days. And as I've said previously, 95% of all absorption occurs in the small intestines because of the brush water and these absorptive cells. The nutrients that are located in the lumen get absorbed in four different ways. The first is through passive diffusion, which is when the concentration of a nutrient is higher in the lumen, which forces the nutrient into absorptive cells. This occurs with fats, water, and some minerals. Another way nutrients are moved into the absorptive cells is through facilitated diffusion. This occurs when there is a higher concentration of a nutrient in the lumen than the cells, but not enough to move some nutrients. They need carrier proteins to shuttle them into the absorptive cells. This occurs with the sugar fructose. Active absorption is when a carrier protein is needed, but ATP is needed. This is called active transport and allows the cell to concentrate nutrients on either side of the cell membrane. This occurs with amino acid and glucose. Endocytosis is a type of active transport that engulfs compounds, which is called phagocytosis, or when absorptive cells engulf liquids, which is called penocytosis. The vesicle is pinched off from the cell membrane and taken into the cell. This happens with immune substances in human breast milk. Once the nutrients are absorbed into the small intestines, they go to either the cardiovascular system or the lymphatic system. This all depends on if the nutrient is fat or water soluble. The cardiovascular system includes the heart, blood vessels, and blood. The nutrients that go this route include protein, carbohydrates, all of the B vitamins and vitamin C. The short and medium chain fatty acids are transported through the cardiovascular system as well. These nutrients are absorbed directly into the bloodstream through the capillary beds in the villi. The blood flows from the villi directly to the hepatic portal vein, which transport nutrients directly to the liver. The liver then can either use the nutrients or store the absorbed nutrients. Any nutrients that are not used enter the general circulation of the bloodstream and are distributed for growth and maintenance of tissues. The lymphatic system contains lymph, which flows throughout the body in lymphatic vessels. The lymph does not pump through the body like blood does. Instead, the lymph relies on muscle contraction to squeeze the lymphatic vessels. The nutrients that enter the lymphatic system are too large to enter the capillary beds in the villi and microvilli. These include fat-soluble nutrients like vitamins A, D, E, and K. This also includes large-chain fatty acids. Before these nutrients can enter the general bloodstream, they have to travel through the thoracic duct, which is from your abdomen to your neck. At this point, it connects to the bloodstream and the fat-soluble nutrients enter the bloodstream. So if you remember this picture from a few slides back, here is our villi, right here. And all these little cells right here are your microvilli, and they're extending all the way around each villi in the small intestine. And then here, we have many, 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 many villi all with microvilli along them. 
surrounding it. And that's where all these nutrients are being absorbed. And so once they pass through this microvilli right here, depending on what they are, they're either going to come through the capillaries right here, which is your red and your blue. So these are your carbohydrates, your small and medium chain fatty acids, um, protein, vitamin C, B vitamins. All of those are water soluble. So they're coming this route with the red and the blue. That's what's going to happen. Now, if we have large chain fatty acids, they're going to go through the lymph because they're too large. They can't pass through here. That just, it's not going to happen. So instead, they're going to come through the lymph. Your B vitamins, protein, carb, small and medium chain fatty acids, once they enter in here through your capillaries, they're going to the liver. They're going straight to the liver. And they're either stored, they're um, absorbed in there, and then, you know, used for energy, or they're going to continue through the liver and go throughout your body for maintenance of body tissues. But if we have fat, like the large chain fatty acids, vitamins, a, D, E, and K, they're coming through the lymph right here. That's the, the green thing is your lymph. And so once they enter this route, they're going to go throughout your body um, in the lymph and the muscles are going to contract all that lymph up and it's got to travel from your abdomen to your neck. And at that point, it's going to connect with your general blood circulation, and that's where it enters into the general circulation. So remember, the green is your lymph, and that's for vitamins A, D, E, and K, which are fat-soluble vitamins, and your long-chain fatty acids. Your capillaries, your cardiovascular system, is for protein and carb, vitamins C, and all the B vitamins and your short and medium chain fatty acids. The large intestine gets its name from the diameter. Compared to the small intestine's diameter of one inch, the large intestine's diameter is two and a half inches. The large intestine connects to the small intestine by the ileocecal valve, which remember is that sphincter. After food has left the small intestine, typically all that is left is water, some minerals, undigested food fibers, and starches. There is about 5% of carbohydrates, protein, and fat that escapes being absorbed in the small intestine. The large intestine is home to hundreds of microbial species, which includes 100 trillion microbial cells. This is more than 10 times the amount of cells in the human body. Most of the microorganisms live in the large intestine, and protects us against pathogens by crowding them out. The microbiota can synthesize vitamins like vitamin K and biotin. They can digest and metabolize complex carbs, fiber, and starches. The bacterial composition of the microbiota is different in every person and also changes throughout the lifespan. Many things affect the microbiota, but the largest influence comes from one's diet. High fiber, plant based diets increase microbial diversity in numbers. There is some thought that these microbiota protect against colon cancer. For individuals with colitis and other diseases that require high dosage antibiotics, patients can receive a fecal transplant so they can replenish the microbiota that antibiotics typically kill off. This is why you'll see doctors recommending a pre and probiotic for individuals that are on antibiotics. Probiotics are living microorganisms that colonize in the large intestine and provides many health benefits. You can find probiotics in fermented foods like yogurt and miso. This is still in the developing stages to know exactly what probiotics do. But for now, there is some evidence that probiotics protect against bile damage that is common in premature infants and can also help with antibiotic-associated diarrhea, IBS, and colitis. 
Prebiotics are non-digestible food ingredients that promote the growth of beneficial bacteria. An example is inulin, which is a carbohydrate known as a fructan because it is made of several units of fructose. It is found in many foods like chicory, wheat, onions, garlic, asparagus, and bananas. Prebiotics that are fermented in the large intestine produce short-chain fatty acids. However, participants that consumed large amounts of prebiotics at 10 to 20 grams per day experienced flatulence and bloating. This is also in the research stages to see the benefits that prebiotics can bring. Almost half of the United States experiences heartburn, and it is the most common GI disorder among adults. This occurs when stomach acid backs up into the esophagus from the stomach. If heartburn occurs more than two times per week, it is called gastrointestinal reflux disease, also known as GERD. This is common in infants and children, and symptoms include spitting up, vomiting, and coughing. Most children outgrow this by one year old. The cause of GERD is not known, but some factors that can contribute is a hiatal hernia, alcohol use, being overweight, smoking, and certain medications. People typically complain of GERD with tomato-based sauces like spaghetti and pizza. The treatment plan for GERD is through lifestyle modification and medication. For someone with GERD, it is recommended to consume small, frequent meals instead of large meals and to wait several hours after consuming a meal before lying down. Limiting alcohol can also help reduce the occurrence of GERD. If these lifestyle modifications do not work, there are several medications that can help reduce the symptoms of GERD. An ulcer is a small erosion on the top layer of the cells in the stomach or duodenum. They can perforate through the stomach or small intestine and cause a deadly infection. Younger individuals usually get an ulcer in the small intestine, whereas older adults get an ulcer in the stomach. The symptoms are a gnawing or burning pain in the stomach between meals and at night. The two main causes are H. pylori infection and heavy use of NSAIDs like ibuprofen and aspirin. To treat ulcers, a combination of antibiotics and either proton pump inhibitors or an H2 blocker to suppress acid production is recommended. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a common chronic liver disorder where liver cells store excess fat, which causes liver swelling and inflammation. These individuals do not abuse alcohol and are hard to diagnose because there are no symptoms. Most of these cases are found due to abnormal liver blood tests during a routine exam. The treatment plan for this is changes in lifestyle through gradual weight loss to lower the amount of fat stored in the liver and reverse the damage that has been done. Gallstones is a frequent cause of illness in surgery that affects between 10 to 20 percent of the U.S. population the stones develop in the gallbladder when substances like cholesterol and bile pigments form crystal-like particles. To prevent gallstones from occurring, people should strive for a healthy weight, avoid rapid weight loss, eat a high-fiber diet, and stay physically active. The problem with gallstones is that there is no symptoms associated with gallstones. There might be some pain in the right upper abdomen, between the shoulder blades, and vomiting. The solution to gallstones is surgical removal of the gallbladder. When the gallbladder is removed, the bile from the liver flows directly into the small intestine. Everyone has gas. Every person produces around one to four pints of gas every day. We release this gas through burping and by passing it through the rectum. Gas is produced by fermentation of undigested carbohydrates by the bacteria that live in the large intestine, that's the microbiota. Swallowing air also contributes to gas. There may be some enzyme preparations that can help with intestinal gas, such as Beno and lactase. This helps reduce the amount of undigested carbohydrates in the large intestine. Another thing that causes gas is a rapid increase in fiber intake. 
So instead of going from consuming no fruit and vegetables and beans, slowly increase your intake so your body can adjust to the amount that you are eating. Constipation is defined as three or less bowel movements weekly. The slower the fecal matter moves through the digestive system, the more water that is reabsorbed. This makes stool become hard and dry. Constipation can also be caused by someone regularly ignoring the urge to defecate for long periods. Diabetes, IBS, and depression can also cause someone to become constipated. We use the Bristol stool scale for determining constipation. Types 1 and 2 are considered constipation. On the opposite end of the spectrum, there is diarrhea. Diarrhea is defined as loose, watery stools that occur more than three times per day and last a few days. This can be caused by bacterial or viral infection from contaminated food or water, which we would call food poisoning. If you look at the Bristol stool scale, type 6 and 7 are considered diarrhea. The treatment for diarrhea is consuming a lot of fluid because you were losing it so quickly. Someone with diarrhea also needs to consume drinks that have electrolytes because they are being lost in the feces as well. Infants and young children need immediate care if they develop diarrhea because they are more likely to experience dehydration. When someone is recovering from diarrhea, they should avoid greasy, high fiber, and very sweet foods because it can aggravate this condition. Irritable bowel syndrome, also known as IBS, is a chronic disorder that is more common in women. The symptoms of IBS include diarrhea, constipation, and alternating between the two. Abdominal pain and distension are two other symptoms associated with IBS. Fructose, which is found in fruits and foods containing high fructose corn syrup, lactose, which is found in milk, and sugar alcohols contribute to symptoms of IBS. Foods that form gas in the large intestine also can aggravate the symptoms of IBS. Foods that typically form gas are onions, cabbage, beans like white beans and red beans, and broccoli. Treatment for someone with IBS is to increase dietary fiber and the use of peppermint oil to relax the smooth muscle in the intestinal tract. Inflammatory bowel disease is also known as IBD, and it is a group of serious, chronic intestinal diseases. This is not related to irritable bowel syndrome. The two most common forms of IBD is colitis and Crohn's disease. Colitis is a recurring inflammation and ulceration that occurs in the large intestine. Crohn's disease is inflammation and ulceration in any part of the GI tract. So Crohn's disease is not isolated to only the large intestine. The inflammation can swell and cause scar tissue that can narrow the GI tract. The symptoms of IBD include rectal bleeding, diarrhea, abdominal pain, weight loss, and fever. Hemorrhoids are also called piles. These are swollen veins of the rectum and anus that are much like varicose veins in the legs. The blood vessels are subject to intense pressure during bowel movements. Obesity, sitting for long periods of time, and violent coughing or sneezing can cause hemorrhoids. Pregnant women are also more susceptible to this. Hemorrhoids can develop unnoticed until a bowel movement occurs that triggers the symptoms of itching, pain, and bleeding. The treatment is the use of preparation H, and some people may need surgery to remove the swollen veins.